Good morning again. It's good to see you with us today for Easter. If you are visiting family from out of town, welcome. We're glad to have you at our church. If you are maybe local and here for the first time, we're glad to have you uh, as well. We're going to give everybody a few minutes to find a seat. It's hard to see when everybody's standing up where the empty seats are when it's this full, but uh, we're going to let them get seated. And uh, as they do, I'd remind you one final time, we do have that opportunity for photos uh, afterwards for you and your family out there in the back. Uh, Somebody asked me earlier this week, another pastor, what we were doing for Easter. And I said what we always do every Sunday. Um, Easter is a special day. I'm not trying to take away from that or, or pretend like that's not true. It is, but every day is a special day when God's church comes together to worship Him and to celebrate who He is and to hear from his word. And so uh, if you are a guest or from out of town, I just want you to know this is what we do every week. Uh, There's no special show today. Uh, We're going to continue on in this series we've been doing called Collision. This is actually part seven of the series, and uh, we're going to worship the Lord like we do every Sunday, and we're going to study God's word like we do every Sunday. And uh, if you like what happens today, you'll like what's going to happen next week, because it's going to be the same next week as we gather again to do it on Sunday, and so we would invite you uh, to come and be with us for that. If you've got your Bibles, open to the Gospel of John chapter 8, where we will focus our time and spend much of our time together there in John 8. As you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Did you know that there are 10.3 million people, million with an M, 10.3 million people in the world right now who are in prison? Probably didn't expect to start the Easter sermon with that, but, but it's true, 10.3 million. That, that number, I looked it up this week in several places, and, and that's what people report. It's actually lower than I thought. I, I thought there would be more people in prison. That's not just for America, that's the world. And that's a, a relatively small number when you consider that there are some 8 billion, billion with a B, people on our planet. So a very small percentage of people who occupy the prisons of the world. I wonder how hard it would be. I've done some prison ministry um, in, in, during my ministry. In fact, my, my ministry almost 30 years ago started with prison ministry because, um, you know, they can't leave whenever you're preaching. So if you're a young preacher, that's a good place to start. And uh, so I started doing, doing uh, chaplaincy ministry and jail ministry in the local jails and prison ministry with uh, some of the big national prison ministries and preaching and teaching in prisons. So I've been on the inside, and, and I was thinking about this statistic, 10.3 million prisoners in the world, and, and I thought to myself, I wonder how hard it would be to find somebody in a prison who wanted to get out. Probably not very hard, Right? I mean, imagine for a minute, let's just imagine for a minute that you had the power, you had the authority to grant anyone in any prison their freedom. That you could show up, and let's just say you had this this magical pardon authority, this magical ability to turn people loose. And you could release one, you could release a hundred, you could release the whole prison if you decided to. And, And let's just say you showed up at a prison as was your custom, and and you went into this prison and you introduced yourself to the warden and you showed him your credentials and how you have this authority, and the warden came over the loudspeaker and he announced to the whole prison, to every prisoner that was in the prison he oversees, and said, hey, guess who's here? Yeah, that guy or that gal y'all have heard about that's going from prison to prison, letting people go, pardoning them, freeing them. All you've got to do is stop what you're doing right now and come out to the yard and line up and hear what they have to say, and you can be free, possibly, today. How many of you think the prison yard would be full? (laughs) Really? Only seven of y'all? Seriously, how many of you? Raise your hand if you think people would show up for that. I do. Now, you're going to have a few holdouts. You're going to have a few guys who are like, ah, I'm sleepy, I'm just going to stay here and cover up. You're going to have a few skeptics who are going to say, ah, it's probably not real, they wouldn't be at my prison, even if they are, they're not going to let me go. You're going to have a couple of guys sitting in the cafeteria going, today's pizza day, I'm not going out there, I'm eating my pizza. You know, you're going to have a few who probably wouldn't come out, but I think the majority of them would want to. 
If I was a prisoner in prison and that happened to me, I think I would look at my buddies and I would say, guys, let's get out of here while the getting's good. Let's go. Let's go out to the yard and see what this guy has to say. You know what's even more astonishing or or more scary, really, than knowing there's 10.3 million people in prison is this. Today, as we worship the Lord, there are billions with a B, six or seven billion people with a B who are held in bondage by sin. They're held in prison by sin. In fact, the overwhelming majority of people on our planet right now are in a spiritual prison this very hour. There are probably many in this room who are in that prison, certainly many who can hear my voice on the radio and the podcast and all the other places it goes, who are in that prison right now. Although they're physically free, they're spiritually held in the bondage of sin. Jesus had a very interesting encounter with a group of people in John chapter 8. And I want us to explore this this morning. It seems like a weird text for Easter, but I promise you it's not. It says this in verse 30. It says, As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him. We have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? And Jesus responded, Truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you really will be free. If I would have been here on this day when Jesus said these words, I hope I would have had the courage, I hope I would have had the the sense, enough sense to say, boys, let's get out while the getting's good. I like what this guy's saying. Today, as we celebrate and as we remember the resurrection of Jesus, that first Easter morning, I want us to focus on the collision that none of us can avoid and very few of us want to talk about, and that's the collision of death. We can do everything we can possibly do to avoid this collision. We can eat our vitamins. We can get up early every morning and go get on a treadmill and run and sweat. And we can do infrared saunas and, you know, we can can go get a massage at the end of every week. We can can eat a salad every day. We can eat a salad for every meal. We can be one of those people that that, that you can tell I'm not, but you 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 can be one of those people. And it's okay if you are, no judgment here, that eats a salad with no dressing. (laughs) Like to the extreme, like not only am I eating a salad, but I'm not going to put anything on it because I'm going to be super healthy because I want to avoid the collision with death. You can do that and you can prolong that collision coming to your life perhaps, but you can't avoid it. Sooner or later, that collision is going to find every single one of us. Agreed? Amen? Amen. We can do everything possible to avoid it, but eventually it's coming. If Easter is about anything, it's about the collision between life and death. Jesus died on the cross but rose from the grave. That's where we see that collision happen. He made it possible for us all to have a victory over death as well. But we've got to get out while the getting is good. I want you to see four things this morning, four things that I believe are very important. The first one is the word transformation. If you're taking your notes and filling in the blanks in the bulletin, it's transformation. When Jesus spoke these words, he was speaking of transformation in verse 30. He says, or it says, many believed in him. They believed in him. They didn't just believe him, they believed in him. And when they did, there was a spiritual transformation that happened in their life. A mysterious transformation that even those of us who have experienced it ourselves would struggle to put words to. So what did he say that brought about this this transformation? What did he say that made these people who chose to believe in him, what did he say that made them say, you know what, I'm going to get out while the getting is good. If you back up to verse 21 of John chapter 8, you'll see it. We'll just start there. There's even more before it, but for the sake of time, we'll begin here. It says, Then he said to them again, 
I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. You are from below, he told them, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Three times he says, you will die in your sins. There's a collision coming between life and death. And Jesus says, if you don't change something, if you keep going the way you're going, if you keep doing the things you're doing, if you continue to stay in the prison, the bondage of sin that you're living in now, he says, you will die in your sins. And some of these people caught on to that and they said, hey, that don't sound good. Let's get out while the getting's good. And they believed in him. Paul spoke about it to the Romans all throughout the book of Romans, beautiful book. But in Romans chapter 6, 23, for example, he says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, sin can only produce death. That's all sin can ever produce is death. All sin can ever bring about in your life or mine or anybody else's is death. In the previous chapter, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Paul said this, he said, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people, because all sinned. In Romans 7, Paul said it like this in verses 5 and 6, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit, for death, not fruit for life, not fruit for good, fruit for death, because that's all sin can produce. Verse 6, but now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us, so that we may serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. You see, there's a, there's a transformation that's possible. There's a transformation that can happen, a transformation that can take place in your life where you can be saved from death by being forgiven of your sin. You can be transformed to serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law, Paul says. But that's only if you believe in Jesus, like I believe some did on that day. Jesus said this in another place in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. See, you need to know that a spiritual transformation is possible, but it's only possible through Jesus. For some, the collision with death leads to what the Bible calls the second death. But for those who believe in Jesus, it leads to life. So I would encourage you to do what some did on this day, In John chapter 8, so long ago, I would encourage you to believe in Jesus. I would encourage you to get out while the getting is good. Second thing I would tell you is there is a time frame. Time frame. You can use the word timeline if you like. Time frame, timeline, it's all the same. Time's a funny thing. Time's a deceptive thing. It's maybe a better way to put it. It's not so much funny, but it's deceptive. It's hard, it's hard to really measure time when you're going through life. And I know what you're probably thinking. It's not hard to measure time. I, I, got, a, I got a watch. I got a clock in my truck. I, I, there's a clock on my phone. There's a clock on my computer. Hey, there's clocks everywhere I look. I, can, I don't have a problem measuring time. There's even a clock back there in the back right now telling me how long to preach. I don't really use it, just so you all know. It's, <laughs> it's more of a suggestion is the way I think of it. And some of y'all are going, well, you shouldn't think of it as a suggestion. You should end on time. Well, y'all should get here on time. (laughs) Let's let's be fair. I'll be on time if y'all will be on time. A couple weeks ago, um, I had the counters count how many people came in late, like after worship was well underway. I think they started in like between the second and third song or between the first and second song. 
Like worship is already going on, the announcements are over and everything. 178 people came in late that Sunday. So when y'all start getting here on time, and when you stay for the whole service instead of everybody getting up or as soon as I say amen and rushing out, when y'all start coming on time and leaving on time, I'll start preaching on time. Deal? All right. Until then, it's a suggestion. Just like y'all treat it. It's a suggestion. So yeah, we, we have the ability to monitor time. We have the ability to manage our time. We have the ability to measure our time, but it still deceives us. Let me give you an example. A couple weeks ago, my son and my daughter um, went to prom. How many of y'all went to prom when you were young? Some of y'all, was a long time ago. You had to think, did I go? Did I not? Prom, it, it, it's a beautiful time. My son and my daughter both, they got all dressed up and um, got ready. My son's date showed up and some of their friends that they were going with showed up and their parents came and we did the whole take a bunch of pictures things, you know, we were out in front of the house taking pictures, we were over by the tree taking pictures and it was kind of a whirlwind, you know, guy pictures, girl pictures, group pictures, individual pictures, sibling pictures, date pictures, you know, we're trying to do all the pictures and we, we got all these pictures done and I was, I was kind of standing back at this one moment um, some other parents were taking pictures, and I wasn't at that, that moment. And I just looked at my son, and I saw me, but like 30 years ago me. And I was like teleported back 28 years ago when I went to prom. Because, I mean, this guy was looking sharp. He had on his suit. We had got him a nice new hat. And he was over there with that big smile on his face. Oh, yeah. There he is. That was me 30 years ago. <laughs> like a p spitting image. And I like saw me in him. And I, I, you know, I was like, man, I'm so proud of the young man he's becoming. I'm, I'm so, so proud of who he is. And then I was like, but where did the time go? I look over at my daughter, and, and, and I was never as beautiful as she, she was on that day, but... but like, I look over at her, and I'm so proud of her, and I think, wow, it feels like just yesterday we brought her home from the hospital. Like, where did the time go? Time is deceptive. A few months ago, I had a phone conversation with a lady who used to go to our church, came to our church for well over a decade, started with us at the show barn, was, was a, a big part of our congregation for a long time. Her daughter called me. She moved away probably seven or eight years ago to be closer to family in her latter years of life. She needed more help than she had down here. And she said, hey, mom doesn't have long to live. And she's asked if she could talk to you one more time. We know it's a long way to come, but would you be willing to visit with her over the phone? And I said, absolutely. So we set up a time and had that conversation. It was a sweet conversation, great conversation. And as we got toward the end of that conversation, she said something that I've heard many times in the course of having those conversations. She said, Pete, I just don't know where the time went. This life just went by so fast, she said. She was 92 years old when she said those words. She passed away about a week later. Again, just points to the fact that time is deceptive. We don't want to admit it, but there's a time frame to our lives. There's a timeline that we're on. James puts it like this in James 4, 14. Yet you do not know what tomorrow may bring, your life, what your life will be. For you are like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That sounds harsh. You're just a poof. Here and then gone. But he's right. The people in our text... They brought Abraham up. They're like, you know, you talk about a perspective of time. They had this big time frame, this big perspective of time. We're the descendants of Abraham. That makes us somebody, you know. Uh, we've never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you're going to set us free? And Jesus is like, hey, you're on a timeline too, man. I think in general, people think they have more time than they actually have. Many think they're just going to get right with God later. They'll do it next Easter, or they'll do it after this part of their life is over. Or 
Many people think they have years or even decades to get serious about their faith and to get serious with God. And, and many people, in fact, probably the great majority of people live their lives as if there's no timeline at all. But there is. There's a time frame. Even the devil is on a deadline. Even the devil knows Jesus is coming back and his time is going to be up. And I think the devil, knowing he can deceive us so easily with time, I think he is extremely happy with the way he convinces us that time doesn't matter. He gets us to think that we have all the time in the world. What's the hurry? What's the rush? What's the big deal? I'll do that later. I'll do it when I retire. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I want you to consider what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Verses 36 through 42, Jesus said, Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. He says in verse 37, As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah boarded the ark. They were just living their lives. They had all the time in the world. He says they didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding grain with a hand on the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore be alert, since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. We don't know what time Jesus is coming back. We don't know what day He's coming back. We don't know what month He's coming back. We don't know what year He's coming back. I don't care what the expert on YouTube says. He don't know either. We don't know what decade he's coming back. We don't even know what century he's coming back. But we know he's coming back. And when he does, if you're not ready, it will be too late. Which is why I'm telling you, you better get out while the getting is good. Even if Jesus doesn't come back in your lifetime. A time will come when you have that collision with death and you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and it will be too late. If you have not believed in Jesus, it will be too late. 2 Corinthians 5 says, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. You and I will all stand there before the judgment seat of Christ and if you have not believed in Him and have been transformed by putting your faith in Him, that's not going to be a good day for you. And none of us know when that day is going to come either. But the reality is, at one point or one time or another, our timeline, our time frame runs out. So you better get out while the getting is good. Number three, I would use the word truth to sum this point up. There is a truth, a truth no one can deny, a truth that Jesus speaks of in our text and throughout the Gospels. So far we know that a spiritual transformation is possible for all those who believe in Jesus. We also know that everyone is on a timeline, everyone has a time frame to their life. Now let's look at the truth. Jesus points to the truth multiple times in the text. Look at verse 32, for example. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He says in John chapter 8 verses 34 through 36, Jesus responded, truly I tell you everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever but a son does remain forever. So if the son has set you free you really will be free. And again further down in verse 58 we haven't read that far yet but in verse 58 Jesus says truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. He answers their whole objection about Abraham down there a little further. The reality is this, church. Jesus never sinned, not even one single time, not even in a little bitty way. He never even told a lie. It's why Scripture testifies things like this in 1 Peter 2.22 where it says, He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. He never sinned. He never lied. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says, You know that He was revealed so that He might take away sins, and there was no sin in Him. 
Jesus even challenged people to find sin in him. Listen, I'm never going to challenge you to do that. I'm never going to be like, oh yeah, oh yeah, find my sin. Go ahead, I challenge you. Because you'll find it real easy. It's not hard. But Jesus, he knew he had never sinned, so he told them quite, a, quite often, he was like, hey, if you think I'm such a bad guy, name my sin. Tell me what sin I've committed. Tell me what wrong I've done. And you know what? They never could. One example of that is in our text here, John chapter 8, a little further down, verses 45 through 46. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe in me. Who among you can convict me of sin? Who among you can name a sin I've committed? If I'm telling the truth, Jesus says, why don't you believe me? In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Jesus is described as the unblemished and spotless Lamb of God. It says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless Lamb. See, I'm taking the time to tell you this and read these scriptures to you because I want you to see when Jesus says things like John chapter 8, verse 34, truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does. So if the son sets you free, you really will be free. When Jesus says something, it's truth. It's not mostly true. It's not kind of true. It's not sort of true. It's not true for these people, but not us. It's not true for that culture, but not ours. It's not true for that generation, but not ours. It's not true because I say it's true. It's not even true because you believe it's true. Truth is truth whether you believe it or not. Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. And Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. If the Son sets you free, you will be free. And I'm telling you the truth. You better get out while the getting is good. I want to close with this last one, point number four. It's the word tragic. Tragic. Because it is tragic when people turn away from and forsake the spiritual transformation that Jesus offers them for free through the grace of his gospel. It's tragic when people fail to realize that their life is on a timeline, that their life has a time frame to it, and they spend their whole lives oblivious of that or rejecting that truth. It's tragic when people refuse to believe and instead to de- decide to reject the truth. It's tragic. It's tragic when people don't choose Don't choose to get out while the getting's good. There's something very tragic we see in verses 30 and 31. It's it's a little detail that could be easy to miss. In in John chapter 8, verse 30, it says, As he was saying these things, many believed in him. And then in verse 31, it says, Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. Now, The commentators here, many of them will disagree with what I'm about to tell you, and that's fine. Um, I can be wrong, or they can be wrong, or we can both be wrong on this. I don't know. But many of the commentators take all of the Jews here in this text and treat them all as one big group. And what is true for one is true for all. They think that, that it can't be both of these statements can't be true, that some believed in him and some only believed him. I take a different approach to this. See, John used a very pointed preposition in verse 30. It's the preposition in. It's a specific preposition. He says, many believed in him. They believed in him. And then he leaves that same preposition out in the very next verse, verse 31. And he says, they just believed him. You see, the tragic truth is this, church. It is possible to believe something without fully believing in something. Let me say that again. It's possible to believe something without fully believing in something. Let me me give you an example. How many of y'all believe I can fly an airplane? 
you follow me on Facebook, you probably believe it. We even have a picture, I think, of my son and I flying uh, about a week and a half ago uh, in an airplane. They teach monkeys how to fly. It's not hard to think I could fly an airplane, hopefully. So most of you, raise your hand, like, yeah, I believe you could probably fly. That's fairly easy to believe. Now, how many of you would believe in me enough to let me be your pilot, the pilot of your plane that you were flying on? Some of you, crazy people, but (laughs) a lot less hands. Not really. I'm a good pilot. I've been flying since 1998. I got a lot of hours, a lot of ratings. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a good pilot. But... But see the difference? Like, many of you raise your hand, yeah, I believe you can do it. And then, I don't know if I believe you enough to get in that tin can with you, though. Right? (laughs) See, there's a difference in believing someone can do something and then saying, I'll get in the tin can and go to 10,000 feet with you and fly somewhere. Most of the commentators here, as I mentioned a moment ago, they deal with them all as a group. I think there were two groups of people that day. I think there was a small group of people who literally believed in Jesus. They had a transformation take place in their heart. They heard what Jesus was saying, and they said, we're going to get out while the getting's good. I believe in that guy. While there were many others, the majority even on that day, who just believed him because of what he was doing. Something similar is found in the Gospel of John in chapter 2, where it says this, while he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. And then the very next verse again, verse 24, it says, Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all. And there's an emphasis there in the Greek on all. And because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. In other words, I think again here, It's highly likely that during that event, many believed in Jesus and had a transformation through believing in Jesus. But many others, even the great majority there on that day, they just believed him because of the signs and wonders and the miracles and things like that. And Jesus knew that. See, Jesus, I believe, has the ability to look into a group of people like us and see the hearts of each and every one of us as individuals. And to be able to distinguish who has believed in him and who has only believed him. There's a difference between the two. And here in John 8, I believe Jesus was addressing them as a group. I I have no qualms about that. It's clear in the text he's addressing them as a group. But I think there were some in that group who had believed in Jesus and many others who had only believed him. And those are the ones that Jesus continues to address. They're the ones he continues to debate with. They're the ones he continues to try to convince. If you jump down to verse 39, he's speaking to those whenever he says this, Our father is Abraham, they replied. And then Jesus says, If you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. But no, now you're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You're doing what your father does. We weren't born of sexual immorality, they said. We have one Father, God. And Jesus said to them, Well, if God were your Father, you would love me, because I came from God and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but He sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word, He says. You're of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in Him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? The one who is from God listens to God's words. This is why you don't listen. Because you're not from God. How tragic. Tragic, don't you think? They were so close, but so far away. Jesus had offered them the chance at a spiritual transformation. Jesus had explained to them that all of their lives are on a time frame and a timeline. Jesus has told them multiple times the truth. And they wouldn't believe in him. I want to close with one more tragic example. This happened as Jesus was dying on the cross. 
as He was being crucified for your sins and mine, crucified for the sins of the world. It's common knowledge, I think most of you probably know, He, he died there with two others on that day. He had a thief, according to Scripture, on either side, criminals. Luke records it like this, Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God, since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. These two men stand as a symbol for all humanity, and we should all take notice. Because they are condemned to die. They are condemned to death. Their collision with death is imminent. They are both in need of a spiritual transformation. They are both on a very short time frame. They're struggling on the cross for every breath. They're struggling on the cross for every ounce of energy to stay alive another minute. They know they're not coming off the cross. They know this is the end for them. And they hang there, both of them, next to the truth, the God of the universe, the Son of Man. And He is the only one who can save them. One decided to believe in Jesus, and one just decided to believe Him. The one who decided to believe Him knew that He could get Him off the cross. Hey, get us off the cross. I believe you can do that. Get yourself off the cross. I believe you can do that. The other says, what are you even talking about, man? Do you not realize? He believed in him. And he's the one who said, I'm going to get out while the getting's good. I'm here right next to Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't just believe he could get him off the cross. He believed he could get him into heaven. He believed he could save him from his sins He believed Jesus was the man who could pardon him for everything he had ever done. He believed in him. And to that man, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Look at it. It's in verse 43. The other never repented of his sins as far as we know. You know what? He died in his sins. He stayed in prison, even though there was a man right there saying, I can set you free. I don't know about you, but to me, that's tragic. What about you? How are you going to respond today? If you're one of the billions of people I mentioned in the beginning who are held in bondage by your sin, who are still in that prison, what are you going to do? I mean, I have good news for you. Jesus is here, and Jesus alone has the power and the authority to set you free. And you can get out while the getting's good. But you've got to respond. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You need a transformation, a spiritual one. Your life is on a time frame, and you've heard the truth, but what are you going to do? Are you going to choose triumph over sin by believing in Jesus, or are you going to choose tragedy in your sin and stay in prison? If I was you, I know what I would do. I did it over 30 years ago. I said, I'm going to get out while the getting is good. And I'm going to believe in Jesus. I hope you'll choose the same. Get out while the getting is good. Let's pray. If that's you and you're here today and have never given your life to the Lord, if you can hear my voice wherever you are in the world, we invite you to pray with us. We're not going to ask you to raise a hand or walk an aisle. We're going to ask you to believe in the Son of God, to confess you're a sinner, to repent of those sins, to believe and confess in His name and in His power, and to have the spiritual transformation take place in your life. If that's you and you say it's time to get out while the getting's good, just pray this. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new. That you would make me whole. I ask by faith that you would forgive me of your sins, my sins, and give me the gift of eternal life. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. 
for your love and for your mercy. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. Lord, as we close this hour, we are grateful for you. We're grateful for the cross. We're grateful that you made a way, a path for us to get out while the getting is good. And Lord, I I pray that we wouldn't just believe it. I pray we would believe in it. Lord, I pray we would believe it enough to tell our friends and family about it. Lord, I pray that we would believe in it to the point that we want to tell our coworkers and our neighbors about it. Lord, I pray that we would believe in you. That we would cast all our fears and worries and anxieties upon you and trust you with whatever our life brings and whatever we're going through. Lord, we believe you are the Son of God. We believe you rose from the grave. And we believe you're coming back for your church. Help us to live like we believe in it. We ask and we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.